Hi, welcome to Brookline Hub In Depth. I'm your host, Harvey Bravman. I'm a video producer, filmmaker, and I'm the publisher of the nonprofit publication, brooklinehub.com. We'll be coming to you with impactful interviews on the important people, organizations, and subject matters that affect the Brookline community. Our first episode features a panel discussion that was hosted by the Brookline Rotary on a film that I produced and directed uh, about the 1960s, Brookline Facing Civil Rights. We also discussed the present state of racial justice here in the town of Brookline. Our panelists um, for the show that was originally recorded on January 8th were Bobby Nabel, who was featured in the film, Brookline Facing Civil Rights, uh, Malcolm Cawthon, who is presently the BHS uh, METCO coordinator, and he's been a prolific uh, teacher at Brookline High for many years, Rob Daves, who's a BCF trustee, as well as a Brookline town member, meeting member, and he's um, been on several committees, committees, including the John Wilson, um, Roland Hayes, and MLK committees. And last but not least, a good friend of mine and kayak buddy, Paul Epstein, who is a Brookline High School social worker, as well as the founder of the Brookline Teen Center. Let's go right to the conversation. I'm going to start, um, I think, with you, Bobby. Um, you um, have sort of, our discussion is really about um, racial and social justice um, from the time that the film Facing Civil Rights was is about, which is the late 1960s after the civil rights laws were passed and um, people like, like you and your husband and others first started coming in and integrating Brookline. Um, so you had the experience of what that was like and then you've lived here since then. Um, and the film sort of starts with you talking about an experience that you had when you were a college student in 1958. You were dating a, a, a white, another white, a white student, and he was beaten up because he was on a date with you. And then the film sort of ends with you're walking through a supermarket and telling the audience that. Um, sometimes you're going, going about your normal things and something or somebody reminds you that you're also black and just what your thoughts are about how far you think Brookline has come since the first time you moved here. And then what are the, what are the parts, the things that we're, issues that we still have um, that haven't changed since then. It's a little hard to talk about from my age now, partly because when you age in a community, uh, people get to know you, you become familiar with things, you either avoid unconsciously certain kinds of experiences um, or they, they don't happen. Um, I, I do remember, um, I'm not a gardener, but I was out doing something in my tree lawn uh, trying to plant something and have it survive. Uh, and this was not so very long after we had moved uh, into our house in Brookline. And um, someone came walking down the street, a white woman, and she looked at me bending down doing whatever I was doing and said, oh, do you do gardens? And I realized that at that moment, she, it didn't occur to her that I lived in the house that I was in, in front of. Um, but on the whole, I was very fortunate and I, I'm not sure what that was due to. It may have had to do with my work, uh, may have had to do with the fact that I chose the right street. Um, but I had friends here. My son had friends, um, 
it didn't keep me from being concerned about my son's encounters um, as he got older, certainly to be concerned about um, how he behaved with police officers, not just Brookline police officers, but those in the Boston area. Um, so in, in one sense, I feel I've lived um, a life less touched by race than I think anyone could expect and for which I'm grateful. Um, but I also see from the experience of others that I know in Brookline that they are not always protected. Uh, and that that is something we need to be aware of uh, to the extent that we are a community that has certain values, uh, that we need to look at our own behavior, the behavior of others uh, and their concern uh, about who pays the price uh, of the attitudes toward race that a number of people still have. Malcolm, um, you, have a, you come to this conversation from a unique perspective of being uh, a student at Brookline High School um, a black student at Brookline High School and um, now teaching and mentoring um, black students, uh, students of color, white students, all students in Brookline. Um, but um, how is it possible to compare and contrast your experiences as a high schooler in Brookline with some of the experiences that your students talk to you about now? Sure, I mean, I think um, in a lot of ways, uh, things are very similar to when I grew up. And, and in other ways, you know, it's really different. I think, um, you know, what kids do and what kids have and, and what and how teenagers behave, you know, feels really different. But every time I'm in class, I know that's a 16 year old. like. You know, I, I always tell my friends, if I had had a cell phone and I could text when I was 16, I would have done it. Like I, I'd have been on there all the time. And so I think there's there's some differences in that in terms of how we interact with one another and things like that. But, you know, when it comes to the root of it, what I hear from students and what I experienced was there were times where just simply existing meant I was threatening, you know? And so if, if I was, if I was walking home and it was dark or if it was um, certain things, you know, that, that meant I was threatening or not supposed to be there. And, and those are the things I actually hear from some of my students, um, stuff that uh, gets perceived as, <coughs> as bad behavior is um, then justification to investigate. And so, you know, the, the examples I hear the most are like, kids running from Brookline Village to get back to class on time. But if they're Black kids running through the village, that gives a certain perception of who and what they are. And in that way, that hasn't changed, right? Um, you know, and, and, and so I think it's really important we recognize that, you know, for, um, for me growing up and sometimes for some of my students, just being Black is seen as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that means they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing. And, um, and so while, you know, I don't wanna act like I have a wealth of these experiences in terms of like, you know, it wasn't a daily thing. It wasn't a, but I have them. And, and, and when I think back upon them, it's, it's, it's actually really problematic. Like, you know, being stopped for things, like when I'm just trying to walk home and coming back from like a, a practice or something and it just you know it's winter and it's dark and I have a puffy coat on so that means I look a certain way to someone and I'm not in a neighborhood that my parents actually fought to get in I mean uh I've heard Bobby's story lots of times and I, I know it really well and you know you know my story is cut from the same cloth you know my parents had to sue two realtors to be able to move into Brookline in 1973 and so you know 
I, I often wonder what would have happened to my life if my parents didn't keep pursuing living in Brookline. And so I appreciate that and I love that and I, I love my community and I have this other piece as well. As a fellow big guy like yourself, um, I know that, you know, what it's like just being, if you're a larger person and people a little more intimidated by you because of your presence, but was it an extra dimension? And, and I've heard parents talking about, t talking to me about how they've had a, you know, they tell their, if they have a, if they're of color and they, they tell their kids, don't, you know, don't wear the hoodie, don't do something that's going to draw our attention. Um, was it, did it create a different dimension because you're a bigger person? So you're the you're a bigger young black person. Did did that in do you feel that that might have intimidated people for for no good reason? But was that a factor? So so I think two things. Uh, you know my size works in, in multiple ways and some of those positive and some of that's negative. Being large, I, I, don't, I, I can't recall very many fights at all in my youth. People were afraid to do that, right? But then also moving through town at times, um, I was often perceived to be older, more threatening than I actually was. Um, and so um, that's important to acknowledge as well as there's a lot of research on this that black children, so whether you're big or not, black children are often misconceived to be older and more physically um, threatening than other race uh, populations. So there's a lot of research. And, and if you think about, you know, Tamir Rice has been in the news and stuff like that. Like, you know, people talk about Trayvon, Trayvon Martin weighed 130 pounds. I was 135 pounds in seventh grade. Like, and that's with him at 16, right? So like, but he was perceived as this threat and like, and so um, there's a real conundrum of like, particularly living in Brookline, like um, where people are supposed to judge and like all those other things. But but we know if a black boy is wearing a hoodie, he's judged different right. or if his pants are sagging, even though kids don't really do that anymore, you know? <laughs> but uh, you know, those things, they get, they get seen as different on black bodies and particularly large black bodies. Um, and so sure, there's, um, I, I, I had to learn really early what it meant to be in the skin and in this body and what that meant to like, um, to navigate the world and how people might see me. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think the gray is helping soften that, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a role that I've had to, I've had to be very conscious of throughout my life. Uh, Rob, I want to bring you into the discussion because you've done a lot of work to um, make the community aware of African-Americans, John Wilson, great artist, um, Roland Hayes in the 1930s, 1920s, um, prolific singer, but most Brookline residents didn't know about him. I doubt they taught much about the, either one of them at Brookline High School. Um, Paul and Malcolm would know more about that, but tell me a little bit about your efforts and, and why it's important for us to know about the important con contributions of um, people of color in our community. Well, I, I think I, I think um, to, for our community to know itself, um, it really has to know its its history. And and people have an idea, I think, you know, a, you know, broad idea that you know we're we're white affluent, um, but you know we have we're made up of individuals, and there's each of us has different experiences, and um, and I think we need. You know, right, right now, I think what's 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 come on all of us is to put each other in each other's shoes, and try to um, try to listen. And and uh, but one one way to do that in a way that uh, helps helps build the image of ourselves as a community is to look at people who were 
um, who attained, um, you know, became famous, uh, did things which were extraordinary. And when you find those stories right here in your own town, in, you know, on a street, you know, the, that's next to yours, uh, it becomes, um, becomes much more meaningful. And I was, I was uh, in my neighborhood here on Pill Hill, we had, we have an association. I was uh, head of that association and I, I stepped down and somebody asked me, what, what would you like uh, us, or what, what did you not do that you wish you did? And I said, well, I heard all these stories about Roland Hayes who lived on Allerton Street, which is near Olmstead Park. Um, and I wish I had uh, done something to help uh, other people learn about him. So the, the, the neighborhood association gave me $1,000 <laughs> as a parting gift, uh, as a pledge. And that kind of, you know, had that big meatball hanging out there. I had to, you know, we, you know had to do something. And um, I, I had known Barbara Brown uh, from her work with Hidden Brookline and uh, talking about the slavery and history of slavery on, on uh, properties, uh, property owners in Brookline. Uh, Malcolm, of course, um, was on that committee. Uh, we had a great uh, recognition of um, the enslaved people who were uh, unrecognized, went to, went to the Revolutionary War and buried at the old burying ground on, on Walnut Street. But anyway, so um, we, we, um, we put together a celebration of Roland Hayes. He was in the 1920s, the most famous um, concert singer in the world. He was the first um, featured singer on a, a, with a major uh, university. He traveled, he traveled the, the, the world, but in here in Brookline, he, um, he actually was quite revered. Um, and he, he was uh, responsible for working with Marian Anderson. Um, he worked with, uh, civil rights issues in World War II at the behest of Dwight Eisenhower. He, he, was, a, he was a big man. Um, after that, uh, um, one of my fellow town meeting members who's a sculptor, um, um, he, uh, he came up to me and he, he, um, he said that, do you know about John Wilson? And I didn't. And, and, and John, John Wilson grew up in, in Roxbury and he lived half his life in, in Brookline and he he sculpted uh, a sculpture of MLK that's in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Um, three weeks ago, on January 6th, when people were storming the Capitol building, there were pictures of this stone visage of, of Martin Luther King. And it just brought tears to my eyes to think that, uh, you know, he was, that, that presence was, was witnessing what was going on um, in that in that building, but but it um, we not just we, we we tried to have events that were public, that were educational, that were celebratory, and that um, that discussed their ideas and concepts. And it was and it's a it's a way for people to um, you know to, to, to think to think harder about what they are. We it's it's as as a white person, um, we live in a certain world, and it's not. It's not the real. It's not the same world for everybody, and uh, we assume that it is, and that's that's our that's our problem. Um, and this is this is one way to break through that. Paul, as a social worker in Brookline, um, you are counseling students who come to you for you know a variety of reasons. Um, I'm thinking about. Um, bullying and cyberbullying and um, how much of that is, is prevalent now at Brookline High School, how much of it has to do with race and or other, you know, people being targeted for other reasons. I want to start by saying, Malcolm, I'm glad that your family was successful in their quest to move into Brookline because that enabled us to know each other for a long, long time, many decades. It enabled your father to coach myself and my brother in baseball. And my brother must have absorbed John's baseball lessons just a little bit better than I did because he took it a little further, let's say. But glad to have you on this panel with me, Malcolm and Bobby, Rob and Harvey. It's a good question, Harvey. I mean, every year, Malcolm knows this to anyone that works with high school students, cyberbullying is just rampant uh, throughout any gathering of teens, whether it's a school or a teen center or, you know, a kid in West Virginia and a kid in Brookline these days can just cyber bully each other to their heart's content because you don't need to be in the same room. Um, 
Sadly, I have to say that also every single year that I've been at the high school, there are cyber bullying incidents that are racially tinged. Um, every year videos uh, emerge on whatever the social media platform du jour is, whether it's Snapchat or Facebook, that feature the N-word, that feature white Brookline high school students saying the N-word. E almost every year, like clockwork. Um, and it, it's really troubling and disheartening that that, that happens every year. And, and no matter how the response is mounted and assemblies are held and very brave and heroic leaders, student body leaders, organize walkouts and marches and speak outs. It just seems like the message doesn't necessarily get absorbed into the student population because the next year it seems to happen again. Um, I will say this though, because I don't want to be Mr. Downer here and, and so pessimistic. I will say this, when, when we think back to June, um, when George Floyd uh, was killed, um, I, I've never seen in, in my career a level of engagement and activism and, and fiery, fiery activism amongst our young teenage population that even approached what I saw in June, July, August, and still continuing. So that's a hopeful sign. I remember that I, I myself, you know, it was just like all of us on this call, on this webinar, watching nonstop news coverage of what was going on in Minneapolis and across the country and literally could not sleep. And I ended up penning, like Malcolm penned a letter that Harvey was kind enough to publish. I penned a letter in June, June 3rd, about uh, what had happened. And I sent it to every student that I, that I knew, every student whose email address I had. And I think it got spread from there. And, so uh, that's a hopeful indicator that the level of activism is there um, and the conversation is continuing to this day. Next up is a public service announcement from a nonprofit publication, brooklinehub.com. And then we're right back to the conversation on the other side. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danielle Myers of ADW Video Productions and brooklinehub.com. Brooklinehub.com is a 501c3 nonprofit online publication dedicated to community building through local reporting and events. Brookline Facing Civil Rights was produced by our founder, Harvey Brofman. The film is about the experiences of African Americans who helped break the wall of segregation that existed in Brookline before the civil rights laws were passed in the 1960s. Last year, the film sold out the Coolidge Corner Theater and included a panel discussion on inclusivity. You can stream the film and the discussion on brooklinehub.com in exchange for a donation to the Brookline Community Foundation's Safety Net Fund. You can also stream Soul Witness, a film that features interviews with Brookline Holocaust survivors conducted 30 years ago on soulwitness.org. Paul, um, uh, thank you for that answer. That, do you think, uh, and you mentioned the, the Black Lives Matter, um, rallies that happened after the George Floyd murder. Um, are there any other, um, is there anything else that the, the community should be aware of regarding um, what our young people are going through as you see it um, since the pandemic started? Uh, any other, anything else that, that you feel maybe the, the general population doesn't know about. Yeah, you know, what I was thinking about is when I mentioned the social media platforms du jour, of course, the, the heavy hitter there is Facebook. And I want to say this about, there's a couple of forums on, on Facebook that maybe some of our audience, I'm not saying that the Rotarian audience skews older, but let's just say it's a possibility that the Rotarian audience skews a little bit older. Uh, if you're not on Facebook, or if you're on it, but don't really visit it much, I want to recommend two sites. Uh, or I don't know what they're called, pages, I guess. Brookline Townwide Discussion is one of them. I believe I have the title right on that. And the second one is Brookline Public Schools Discussion Group. Those are the two that, that I think are worth dropping into fairly regularly and monitoring what's going on there. Because Harvey, on those both of those sites, it's sort of become, let's face it, the public square, especially during COVID, during the pandemic, when we can't have gatherings to do forums at the Coolidge Corner Theater and or on Cypress Field. We have to do it this way. The, there's some very rich, very important 
knowledge being dropped on the daily on those both of those platforms. Um, and let's go no further back than this week with the Raul Fernandez. I don't even want to call it the Raul Fernandez controversy because that makes it sound like Raul Fernandez did something controversial, which he really didn't. Um, but the, the issue around his comments and then the blowback that he received, um, it's being discussed in a really important way on those pages. Of course, the temperature gets hot on those pages. Of course, people say inflammatory things that are insulting to, to me as a reader and others. Um, but you got to maybe take that and wade through it to get to some really important stuff like young people posting their modern day experiences. Sorry, Malcolm, that made you sound old. Modern day versions of what Malcolm went through uh, when he was walking through, you know, home from practice. And I, I wouldn't hear those stories. I probably would actually as a social worker, but many of us, many of the people that read that page would never hear those stories unless they went there and read them. So just something to think about. And I, I do want to go back to um, what you're talking about, um, to the Raul Fernandez uh, situation. Um, it, it's not a Raul Fernandez situation. It's a, it's a situation where he's been actually the victim of exactly. this. I recently interviewed um, people uh, whose parents were in a, another film that I produced, uh, Soul Witness. Uh, they were second generation Holocaust survivors. And they were in that discussion, um, which if you watch um, Brookline Interactive Television, it's gonna be on several times on channel three um, this coming week. And is also on the Soul Witness um, YouTube channel. Um, but they talked about um, the things that reminded them or would have reminded their parents um, in the 1930s. And they talked about, and, and their parents in their testimonies that I watched talked about the things that were happening in the 1990s that reminded them of Germany. We talked a lot about fear and how and the in how fear, um, the effect that it had in Germany that led to the atrocities, fear of doing the right thing because we're all human and we only have one life and you may be giving up your, that life to do the right thing and how much fear of doing the right thing had to do with keeping your mouth shut when your neighbors were taken away and dragged down the street um, and how they were reminded of that when they heard on television uh, members of the House and the Senate talking about their fellow House and Senate members, how they feared that if they voted a certain way on issues regarding that attack on the impeachment of former President Trump, that their family, they and their families would be at risk of real harm. And how, when our leaders are afraid, um, how that the trickle down to where every citizen becomes afraid of standing up. But what happens when people start really getting threatened? And that's what happened in Germany. And you're talking about fear, Malcolm. And at what point does it change our behavior? I think sometimes we miss the fact that um, uh, fears um, motivate a lot of things. And um, fear can also be very real in a traumatic experience. So one of the things, um, that really came out at Brooklyn High School from adults and kids, you know, was just how fearful they were to see what happened on January 6th. Um, you know, a teacher friend who had lived through Tiananmen Square was frightened, like, like to the point of tears, because she's seen when uh, force is, is used to regulate and she, and, you know, I think about uh, a student who won the superintendent award this year. I mean, he's a Syrian refugee. He has seen when people have taken over countries and turned them upside down. 
And I, and I use those two because, you know, one kid is 18 and I won't tell, my grandmother said, you never tell how the age of a woman. So I won't say how old the teacher friend is, but you know, like, like those are very real fears that, you know, January 6th reopened wounds. And I think what I see in Brookline a lot is what I often refer to as upholding the brand. And there's a fear that if people are critiqued or challenged or asked to change, that means we have to look at the brand of Brookline as being this good place with good people in liberal and maybe have to adjust that a little bit. And that's fearful for a lot of people. Um, I said that article, I felt like what was said towards Raul and Dr. Fernandez sounded like anger, but was truly fear. It's fear of, you know, the critique of their positions and their jobs being changed for them and what they think is good and what they think is working. And despite the fact that there's been an outcry to say, maybe it's not working for everybody. And even in some cases, not working for a majority of folks, that fear wins out to say I'm right. And I think it's, it's humanly hard to get out of that way. We want to think what we're doing is right. We want to think what we're doing is, is serving everyone. And when we're told it's not, that becomes a really hard thing to absolve. I mean, I really wonder how, you know, how do those people who wanted to quit the NFL feel because of Colin Kaepernick, when they were saying he was like a disgrace to all these other things and everything else, like that seems so tame now right. to me before the flag. But it was so different than what everybody was used to seeing, even though there's been other things before and other practices before. It was just so different that, that I think that fear really bubbled through and, and in a really ugly way. And so that, that's the thing, you know, I, I, I'm grappling with myself and trying to figure out, like, when am I supposed to fear? Was I really supposed to fear Colin Kaepernick? Right. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and some people in that first year would have said yes. All right. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, again, what I know when that kid talks about knowing what it's like when a country's taken over, I know his fear. Right. I, I, like, like that, like that comes through so clear to me. Um, and just like that teacher friend who I'd never seen her like that, like she was so shook from like her past experience. And, um, and that fear was real. She was really scared that like she had left the country, came here, and that was going to happen again. Thanks again for joining us this evening. We'll be back next week to continue our conversation with Bobby, Malcolm, Rob, and Paul. See you then.